I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. I'm Mariah King. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Let me do the intro here, Daniel, unless you have something. Uh, I would probably just bumble and fumble about. Cool. <laughs> so this week, we're taking a slightly different direction with our weekly episodes. And with this show, so often we're talking about these things that maybe are happening right now, but the consequences are way off in the future. But increasingly, as our world collapses around us, these things that we hope will not come to pass are becoming current events and news of the day. So we thought we'd take a chance to look at some of the news articles that are happening right now and have a little discussion about them. So we hope you'll enjoy this special roundtable edition of Ashes, Ashes. And we're happy to be joined again by a recurring guest, Mariah King, who's going to sit in on these conversations, provide a little perspective from our limited view here, David. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. As are we. So uh, where do you want to start, David? You want to start with one of my articles, one of your articles, one of... Well, listeners, the format is each one of us brought uh, two articles to this show. Maybe we get to all of them, maybe we don't. Uh, but we're just going to quickly summarize what they are about. You can find the links to them on the website if you want to read them yourself. Uh, now is a good place maybe to pause, catch up on them if you want to feel like you're participating in this. But if you just want to get the basic overview, we'll handle all that right here. Don't worry. Uh, these are all very general ideas. We picked them because they address something that we feel is important to discuss at the current moment. Um, I have one that's on surveillance and profit, and one also that is on uh, the unfortunate, uh, very recent shooting in the mosques of New Zealand. Um, I know this is a triggering thing for some people. This will be the last thing we discuss today. So if you don't want to listen to that, don't worry. You can cut out at the end of the show. Um, I brought some. I brought an article about freedom technologists, mm. um, and then another article on mining and mining finance. Nice. Uh, I I brought articles about dolphins and time, like, like dolphins in time, or like dolphins, or like uh, dolphins, comma and time. Okay. So, so two <laughs> articles, one on dolphins <laughs> and one on or, or may, no dolphins semicolon time grammar is not your strong point, <laughs> daniel so let's well, let's talk about one of those i think those that sounds like a good way to open it let's talk um, about the dolphins what's happening with the dolphins yeah. what's up with the dolphins so as you as you all are aware dolphins are incredibly intelligent they're social creatures um and if you're unconvinced here's a funny quote from douglas adams hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy <laughs> quote wait if you're unconvinced of the intelligence of dolphins Here's a quote from a piece of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on. Quote. <laughs> on the planet Earth, man had always assumed that he was more intelligent than dolphins because he had achieved so much. The wheel, New York, wars, and so on. Whilst all the dolphins had ever done was muck about in the water having a good time. But conversely, the dolphins had always believed that they were far more intelligent than man. For precisely the same reasons. End quote. Um, Wait, so we're supposed to be convinced that dolphins are smart because dolphins in this fictional book also thought that they were smarter than humans? The point is, <laughs> Mariah and David, that we published an episode last October, number 44, Do Not Disturb, where we interviewed Dr. Bernie Krause on sound ecology and the way that dolphins and other animals organize their vocal patterns in the wild according to what he called niches, right? Either temporal or frequency niches. And a couple weeks later, on October 24th, a paper was published by researchers out of Cornell University in New York and the University of Maryland, which is encouraging first off because one of the things that Dr. Krauss uh, was frustrated with is how behind the United States is in soundscape ecology research. Uh, but anyway, this paper examines the effects of ship noise on the vocal patterns of bottlenose dolphins in the western North Atlantic Ocean. Do you remember episode 44, Mariah? Do not disturb. Do you remember it, David? Of course. It's one of my favorites, Daniel. And the basic premise is that 
a species organize their voices in the wild in like really unique ways, in ways that I had never thought of, never realized. And in a lot of ways, the research is way far behind. But the idea is like if a bird is chirping or something, um, it wants that, that chirp to be heard by presumably other members of its species. But there's all these other animals going on and off, right? There's this background noise of wind and water and all this stuff. So in order to have its voice heard, it's got to find a place on the bandwidth of sound that is not being taken up by anything else. And there's so many functions that can be, uh, uh, that can be carried out by this unique, you know, finding of a unique place for your voice, whether that's hiding from predators or finding a mate, finding food, all kinds of things. And so when we introduce sound from the human cacophony of all our activities, it can disrupt the ability for animals to use their voices the way they've evolved to do. And it can cause a whole breakdown of their fitness or their ability to survive. I zoned out. <laughs> what was? <clears throat> Did you address the language part yet? Because I have things to say. So going back to this paper that was published last October, dolphins are super smart. And we know this in part because the language that dolphins use to communicate is super complex, right? We can look at a spectrogram of dolphin whistles and see all this complexity. And so we know that they're conveying not just information about predators or food in the area, but they also use their voices to navigate, to convey social ideas. And just like us, their voices are distinctly individualized. And these researchers hypothesize that the introduction of ship noise of vessels in the area would require dolphins to alter their communication patterns. And that is exactly what they discovered. So what you're saying here is that these dolphins are having to deal with this constant loud droning of all these ships. And, and I think it's good to remember here that sound travels much farther through water than it does above water. Oh, man. So a single ship can have uh, very wide-reaching effects. And, and I mean, even when you're standing on top of a ship... I was going to say, ships are loud. Yeah, they're loud. Yeah. And that's just the above-ground stuff. So the, the, everything that's happening beneath oh, the water God. is going to be that much louder. And uh, oh. they're having to deal with this constant cacophony, I guess. And it's not surprising that uh, they would have to adapt to that in some way. But can you imagine, like, constantly just hearing this loud sound just all the time while also trying to, like, well, you probably can't imagine because you're human, but that's just, oh, my God. You know, I was thinking about this, and have you ever noticed how, like, say the three of us are talking and we're in a quiet room and there's no distractions. We can, we can talk about all kinds of things, right? Really complex things. We can talk about these types of systemic issues, we can form really elaborate sentences. But then you take the three of us and you transport it to us to like a, a really loud bar in Brooklyn, for instance, with like music blaring. And when I find myself in those situations, literally the only sentence I might usher is like, I'll point across the room and just say bathroom or something. What? Just to let you know where I'm going. Like, I'm not going to be able to form really complex sentences with all that noise. And so that's what these researchers figured out with these dolphins. I'm having trouble forming complex sentences right now. Um, no, I mean, the, there's such a, a tragedy to this. I mean, we, we've we just so thoroughly destroyed so many things uh, environmentally in terms of ecosystems around the world with our, you know, everything we do. And now, you know, we've, yeah, I guess extinction of all these animals is something terrible and we should feel bad about it. But there's something specifically heartbreaking about the idea that these ships, which primarily are traveling around because of our global trade needs, and how much of this is, is just carrying useless stuff that we don't need, or maybe exporting that garbage, Daniel, like we talked about last week, from the UK or from the US, across the ocean to the Pacific. Right. Um, like, very useless actions in the grand scheme of, of these things when we're talking about efficiency uh, of, of resources. But I think tourism is also a big part, too. It is, but it's it's nowhere near as much as, as this industrial scale of it. Well, I was going to say, when I think of dolphins, um, I remember my time in Cambodia and the Mekong dolphins, um, the river dolphins are like pretty much extinct. And it was pretty much just because of um, a lot of pollution, but also a lot of tourism, lots of boats. And yeah, like the noises and the sounds. Yeah, we have all this pollution and stuff coming from these things. And yeah, we're contributing to carbon dioxide release and warming the world up and killing all these creatures this way. But also in this very heartbreaking way, this this unseen, unthought about externality, uh, in this case, just loud sounds is actively making 
one of our most intelligent other creatures on this planet actively dumber because of this. Right. Uh, yeah. We're making the world a less rich place. And it's not necessarily impacting an ecosystem directly, though. I'm sure it is um, in this specific example. But there's it's something so sad about that. Yeah, I actually commented in our Discord channel about this article. I shared it and I said, this ocean noise causing dolphins to simplify their language is pretty profound. Not only are we making ourselves dumber, but we're dumbing down animal culture too. And someone commented, and they, uh, Julian Xian, they said, that would make one hell of a Black Mirror episode, have something like the Windsor, Ontario hum that gradually gets louder and drowns out human communication. And I had to look that up because I didn't know what the Windsor, Ontario hum is. Have y'all heard of this? Mm-hmm. No, I haven't. So basically, in this t- there's a town in Ontario, Canada, uh, where there's this intermittent low frequency hum. It starts and it stops. And it drives people crazy and no one knows where it's coming from. The University of Windsor actually did a study in 2014 to try and locate the source of it, but they couldn't really definitively say where it came from or even why, but suggested it might be propagating from some industrial activity like quarry mining or something like that. Well, uh, not even just the sound, Daniel, but how much of our environment around us is just constantly barraging us with just useless information because absolutely the sound is part of it. But like if you're walking through a city, uh, like when I walk downtown in Manhattan at points, there's just between all the sounds and the endless advertisements and billboards and electronic screens that are just everywhere around me, my whole attention is being attacked endlessly by people trying to sell something to me or trying to get me to act in some certain type of behavior. And and it's easy to ignore it, at least like on a very, uh, you know, high level. But what is it doing to my subconscious? All the stuff that we expose ourselves to all the time, like, is this actively changing our behaviors? Is this changing uh, our language as well? Uh, and I'm sure the answer absolutely has to be, of course. But it's not something we think about in our day-to-day life. And then the fact that we're carrying these same destructive tendencies out to the natural world as well is just, like I said, heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I never actually said what the paper found specifically. What, for the dolphins or the other thing? The dolphins. Oh, for the dolphins. The dolphins score much lower on IQ tests. So therefore, the scientists recommended purging them so only the smartest dolphins survive. (laughs) Oh, God. So specifically, they measured... 11 different traits in dolphin whistles. There's, they had duration, start and end frequencies, minimum, maximum, delta frequency, the presence of a harmonics, number of extrema, inflection points, saddles and steps. I don't know what any of this is, but it sounds complex. And they compared this to... <laughs> ashes, ashes, everyone. <laughs> I don't even think my voice has that many uh, complexities, but... Yours only has one that they measure. It's smoothness. Ooh. What's my smooth level right now? <laughs> Like I'm, a, probably, I'm probably at like a six, hoping to get to I was going to say like a six. Finish your thought, six. <laughs> okay, so they compared the dolphin <laughs> whistles to uh, the frequencies of like uh, these ship vessels. And they found that in the presence of the ship noise, dolphins significantly reduced both the complexity and the duration of the whistles. From the paper, quote, It is unknown what impact the shortening and simplification of calls may have on the information communicated. There are, to our knowledge, currently no studies that have addressed the call receivers to determine if and how call simplification may affect dolphin fitness. Vocal communication is important in dolphin mother-offspring interactions and social bonding. The frequency modulation pattern of calls carries identity and other information, and consequently there could be changes to the level of information communicated if individuals respond to increased ambient noise by simplifying the features of their whistles. The ambient noise environment could also affect vocal learning, as young animals exposed to elevated noise may hear adjusted calls from Uh, other members of their species, which I think that's what really stands out to me. I think you you caught that, Mariah. It's like, it's it's not just that they're simplifying their language, but they could be foregoing the passing down of knowledge and accumulated culture. But that's so scary because it's like, I think you said... They're like, it's like vocal training or they're hearing their mother's calls, but through the background of like all that ambient noise. So like, if you imagine if we did stop, you know, if we didn't have as many ships and everything, the the dolphins, the baby dolphins still learn their mother's voices in the context of that sound. So I think you said it wouldn't even sound the, the same. I don't know if that makes sense. 
because these older dolphins have adjusted their language to deal with the noise, uh, the younger dolphins never learn the more complex language. They never learn how to speak in that way. And so that means that yeah. even if the, the sound was eliminated completely, like if we we're like, oh, this is terrible, let's take all the ships off the ocean, it doesn't matter because that information has been lost because it hasn't been passed on to the next generation. Oh my God. So we've wrecked however countless many years of dolphin language evolution because we're just constantly blasting this noise into the ocean. We spent 30 minutes talking about dolphins, y'all. We had to, we had time to move on. <laughs> but it's interesting. It's interesting. It's a... Uh... So dolphins getting dumber, humans getting dumber because of whatever this Windsor, Ontario hum is, plus all the other noise that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, all the distractions like you're mentioning, David, plus all the CO2 in the air like we talked about in Last Gasp. All kinds of things. But why don't we shift gears, David? What, what do you have for us? Um, yeah, okay. So uh, what I have right here is... Uh, let me pull it open. So it's, it's a pretty benign article uh, published to Bloomberg, everyone's favorite financial news source. Uh, it came out just a couple days ago, actually, on March 21st this year. And it's an article that sort of gives an insight to how some of these uh, hedge funds and, and traders are working in the financial market to get ahead of each other and to find that extra little bit of information that can give them the edge in the trading to make a profit. Mm -hmm. And so basically what's happening is these funds are specifically looking at oil companies, refineries, uh, pipelines, different people doing this distribution uh, and trying to figure out anything they can to get, like I said, a leg up. And what they've done is started using all these surveillance techniques to find this additional information. And we sort of privatized mass surveillance in order to make a buck. Uh, so l let me explain. This is not something that's new, but... What surveillance are they using and how are they making money off Well, that? at this point, it's not uncommon to be doing this kind of stuff. Uh, people are pulling all sorts of information from the internet. Um, there are some hedge funds that are actively trying to look for like unprotected databases, which is sort of a gray, black hat area hacking to try and get information. Um, there are people who, you know, for a long time, they've hired private investigators or people to be on the ground to watch stuff and see if anything looks out of place. That might give them an edge. Um, but with the advent of technology that enables mass surveillance and the ability to cheaply access it outside of the state, but instead in the private industry, has totally changed everything. So it, it for a while, they've been looking at satellite photos as they become available. I think actually some of them now even have their own satellites that they use for monitoring various types of things. I know, Daniel, we had mentioned uh, at some point that like... Uh, some of these funds were counting how many cars were in parking lots at Walmart using satellite or aerial photography, things like that. Yeah, I remember I remember several years ago, uh, there was a small startup that owned satellites, like really high quality, real time mm -hmm. photographing satellites. And then Google bought that up. And then financial companies were contracting Google or or trying to purchase these satellites for themselves because they realized, oh, we can get a leg up on financial speculation with real-time satellite images because we can look at the parking lots of Walmart in real time, track how many cars go, and that will give us an idea of the retail market way before you know these large bureaucracies like the U.S. government release official numbers on, on this stuff. And at the same time, we can use these to track how wheat is growing in the Midwest somewhere to see what the crop commodities market is going to look like before anyone else does. And so, it, yeah, this has been going on for a while. So they've taken this to an entirely new dystopic level. And, and maybe you saw an article or maybe we talked about it on here. We've had so many episodes, it's hard to keep them straight. Um, but a few months ago, it was revealed that you could basically for a hundred or so dollars buy location information on almost anybody as long as you had their phone number. That's so crazy. Like a hundred dollars really? per person. Or yeah, like it was. I mean, it's basically nothing. And there are services that buy this data from the phone companies and then package it up and then you can purchase access to it. And it's used for private investigators, bounty hunters, debt collectors, all these people oh who God. might need to know where somebody is. And it's very publicly accessible. You can go online, search this, do it yourself. It's no problem. Wait, now, is this real time location data or is this, this uh, real historical? No, this is real time real data. Question. That's crazy that you can buy location data for that cheaply. And there's like, okay, so there's like nothing you can do to stop that. Like you can't like turn off, like no. you can't turn off anything. You can right? not okay. have a phone oh, and it doesn't even have to be a smartphone. That's just so ridiculous. It could be one of those fucking, what do you call them? The throwaways? What do you call those? A phones? burner. 
a burner. Burners stick out. You shouldn't use them anymore. That's another conversation. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> what they've done is these funds have identified people who work on these oil pipelines, oil rigs, refineries, gotten their phone numbers, but also uh, contractors who might be employed by them, uh, other people, and are constantly surveilling them, figuring out where they're moving. And say, like, if it's the middle of the night and somebody who's normally working during a day shift is woken up, drives to work, and is working on the refinery, as well as a bunch of other people, they know, using this metadata, basically, that there has been a disaster or a problem at one of these refineries, and it's going to impact production. Or it might be the same case for a pipeline. If, if somebody's driving out to somewhere that there normally isn't, that means that something needs to be serviced, things are going to be impacted, and they're going to be uh, showing up on the final end of quarter report. And if you can short that beforehand, then you can make a big buck on this. That's so crazy. Like, literally, you can't even fuck. What can you do? Like you said, what, don't own a phone? Like, that's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I, I mean, this is like such an amazing invasion of privacy just to make a little bit of money. And the reason I bring this out specifically, I mean, most of us aren't oil workers. Most of us aren't working at hedge funds. So, like, we very much don't have any skin in this particular story. But I think it's a great illustration of this type of surveillance that is happening increasingly all around us that has been enabled by our acceptance overall of the general trend towards surveillance. So all these tools have been made and they're all out there and now they're increasingly accessible. And maybe it's just hedge funds using it now, but as this technology gets cheaper and more ubiquitous and they try and expand the market in which they can sell it to, we're going to see the decreasing price. We're going to see increasing uses increasingly retailers and advertisers are going to use this information to try and target us in various ways. Your health insurance companies are going to be using this data, your auto insurance companies, all these people who have some sort of stake in where you are and what actions you might be taking are going to be playing into this. And then imagine too, like if, if uh, I'm a person of interest, a notable celebrity or something, or a politician, then there's going to be tons of people trying to purchase this data from me. And, and I imagine there are some protections available to these people. Uh, but it only takes one small crack in this overall system, and then all this data is loose and free. And, uh, I mean, newspapers going to be interested in that, people trying to, to blackmail uh, tabloids, uh, lobbying firms, other groups. There's so much value in knowing where somebody is. Right. And not just the obvious value, but, like, the things that you can do with this data in order to manipulate both that individual and others. Uh, it's unbelievable, the panopticon that we've built. And, and to enable all of this, to allow all these practices to occur and how little fanfare that has been about it and the just like general acceptance. Right. It seems like just a few years ago, there was like this national debate about whether the U.S. government itself should be able to subpoena AT&T for cell phone data. And then here we are, fast forward to 2019, and anyone can buy that, you know, for $100 and then use it to speculate on financial markets. Like. <laughs> But we we were discussing whether it was even right to do that in the interest of national security, and now we basically just given it up to anyone with the who's willing to pay for it. And just one really funny thing I want to point out at the end of this article that that has nothing to do with the specific surveillance part. Um, but if you scroll to the bottom of the Bloomberg article, um, it has this little passage, this very innocuous sentence right at the end that says, "Orbital, which is the company in question here that's doing this or enabling this tracking." has received funding in the past from Bloomberg Beta, a venture capital unit of Bloomberg. Oh, so they're reporting on themselves. <laughs> so they're reporting on this like thing. But if you read this article, it's very much not a negative look at it. It's not saying, look how shocking this is. It says, look how cool this tech is. Look how... But see, that's what I thought when I read it. It allows them to invest all this... It allows them to make millions of dollars by knowing this. It's so arrogant. And it's an ad. This is an ad. They are advertising this company <laughs> that they have, are invested in. And, and, and that like extra layer of, of just like the complete dystopia we live in, I think, really <laughs> makes this article for me. Yeah, I didn't catch that last bit. But before even knowing that, I kind of read it a little bit. And it seemed really kind of like, hey, yeah, hey, look at what we're doing. Maybe you can be creative and do something like this, too, in the future. Mm -hmm. Catch up. Like, so arrogant. Well, uh, I think this would make a good segue into the other article I wrote that I read because, you know, we talk about surveillance a lot and we talk about the motivations for it, you know, being profit and, uh, you know, the ways you can manipulate for political gain and all this. But 
now I'm thinking about it in this in terms of this concept of time and how time accelerates in our modern economic society. And I see surveillance as as having to do with this. And so the article I read, it's not really news or anything like that, but it's uh, from the sociologist who writes about social acceleration. And you know, if you think about the surveillance, what is really happening is these financial markets, it's not enough to just make profit selling stocks, but in order to compete, in order to get better at doing that, in order to keep making the same levels of profit, they have to speed up the rate at which they can find out information. And then, of course, the rate at which they can trade. Like we've all heard about on Wall Street a, a few years ago, that one company that spent like so much money to uh, build their own fiber optics cable so they could get a little bit closer to the stock exchange and increase their trading speed by like 0.002 seconds, right? And so surveillance is kind of the same thing. It's not enough to just find out the next day in the news how the oil markets are doing. You need to actually surveil the workers in real time to figure out as best you can what the extraction rates are. And, and, and there's this acceleration going on in so many aspects of our society. Think about money itself, where it used to be cash, and then it became the ability to transfer money through bank accounts. And then we got credit cards. And it's this shortening of time in order to complete transaction. And of course, what goes along with this is the reshaping of culture in an accelerated way. The way we live our lives is accelerated. The way we relate to other people is accelerated. Uh, so I want to flesh this out just a little bit. I want to start with um, something I read a while back in Primo Levi's book, If This Is a Man. And he's a Primo Levi was an Italian chemist, a Jewish chemist who was imprisoned in Auschwitz. He wrote this book in 1947 on his experiences. And, and there's, there's this one chapter where he and a few other chemists, they, uh, their, their prison guards found out that they know chemistry. And there's a, a nearby private company that needs cheap labor. So they are awaiting a chemistry examination, which will determine if they qualify for a specialist job at this local company. And as they wait to take this test, uh, Levi reflects on the absurdity of taking a professional exam as this emaciated, starving, you know, bad smelling man. He, he mentions the snot running down his nose. He's got to take this test in a language he he doesn't understand, and he's wondering if he's even going to survive right after this test. And he writes, "Quote: Three days passed. Three of those usual immemorable days, so long while they are passing, and so short afterwards. And we were already all tired of believing in the chemistry examination. Uh, so keep that phrase in mind: the immemorable days." And so finally, fast forward a little bit. He and six other men are summoned for this test. And they get placed in the lobby and they're told to wait in silence until the exam. And he says, quote, we're satisfied with this waiting. When one waits, time moves smoothly without need to intervene and drive it forward. While when one works, every minute moves painfully and has to be laboriously driven away. We are always happy to wait. We are capable of waiting for hours with the complete obtuse inertia of spiders in old webs. And so there's this idea that time can be experienced and perceived in different ways, right? Again, how Levi writes about how the immemorable days were long while they were passing, but so short afterwards. And this is something any of us can relate to. Not to say we can relate to being in a concentration camp, but having the different experiences of time is something we've all felt. Maybe you've worked a boring job and you stared at the clock wondering why it moves so slow. This has a name. It's called the subjective paradox of time. And so this German sociology professor, Hartmut Rosa, argues that the acceleration of time under capitalism has been affecting our collective experience of time. And this is what he writes about in his book, Social Acceleration, A New Theory of Modernity, which I haven't read yet, but the article I read was just an interview with him. And so let me quote from his explanation of the subjective paradox of time. <clears throat> Quote, when we have a really exciting day with a lot of powerful and memorable events and impressions, then time flies during the day. But when we look back in the evening, it feels like it was a very long day. Conversely, when we have a totally boring day, which we spend waiting in some meaningless waiting room, time goes by very slowly. 
But when we go to bed in the evening, it seems like we had a very short day, like we just got up. This is called the subjective paradox of time. We feel that the day or the year was long when it leaves a lot of traces in our memory and our identity. We remember the things that truly impress us, the moments which we really appropriate. Therefore, if we have lots of experiences that resonate with us deeply, the year or a life seems long in hindsight. Seems real long right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me well let me speed it up for you, David. Um, so, one more quote. He goes on to say how this leads to alienation in our modern society. Quote: But in late modern lives, we lose the capacity to appropriate our experiences. We do many many things, but they do not really touch or affect us. At the end of the day, we have forgotten them. This is part of what I call alienation. Because most of what we do does not leave any traces in our memory, biography, or identity. We feel time is flying by quickly. This is the twofold explanation for the subjectivist side of social acceleration. Okay, end quote. So I think what really uh, resonated with me about this is I think it goes back to episode 63 we did, Busy Work, right? Which we discussed bullshit jobs. Because while more of us are doing more and more work at this faster and faster pace, being driven by these insufferable managers. We believe all this extra work is just bullshit. We're bored. We're doing monotonous things. And so we experience the passage of time as it occurs as being excruciatingly slow and painful. But by the end of the week, when we look back on our time, it seems like it flew by because nothing we did resonated with us. It was immemorable. Can I offer some some thoughts here? <laughs> Or are there are there more quotes that we we get to <laughs> get to hear? Look, David, is don't blame me that you came with some two hundred word art <laughs> from uh, Bloomberg. Well, I'm sorry, I did my research for this show. I'm actually I'm about to uh, school you on your research. Uh, there's nothing I love more on this show than looking back at some obscure technological invention that happened six or 700 years ago and seeing how that totally destroyed our sense of everything to today. Uh, we've done this so many times on this show, Daniel, our invention of maps and the modern mapping technology and how that brought us borders, the Industrial Revolution and how that dramatically changed intellectual property. Uh, well, very, very, very quickly, I want to take you through um, just some clock stuff real quick, because I think one of the things that, that this article that you brought in uh, glosses over is is our insistence on measuring time and how that totally changed we experience it because so often when you're doing something enjoyable you're not worrying about the clock but when it's something awful you're like okay you know it's four o'clock i have another hour to go and so you drag out it changes physically how you uh think about time and how how you experience it but before you jump in i don't disagree with you um <clears throat> and this is this is actually uh, I have bullshit jobs open in front of me because it has some excellent passages on uh, time and our perception of time because it is something that is so closely linked to our labor. Uh, but David Graeber in here mentions a uh, essay called Time, Work Discipline and Industrial Capitalism. It was written in 1967 by E.P. Thompson, which I think is one of the original essays here trying to rethink about. Which, by the way, is linked on the website if you go to uh episode 63's webpage. Which goes into some depth about all these different ideas about time and our relation to it in terms of labor and, and economic systems. But but very simply to break down what Graeber and what Thompson discuss is that our ability to very precisely track time and to do so on an individual basis really changed how we talk about it, how we divide it up, uh, our concepts about it, and ultimately the way that we experience it. So back, way back when, so talking about 1400s, 1500s, There was a conception of time in terms of the lifespan of somebody. So you would oftentimes have, you know, if you were somebody well off who who philosophized about time, uh, you would put a skull on your desk, a human skull, as a reminder that death is coming and that you are constantly heading towards it and you need to be mindful of every day to make the most of this, this memento mori idea. Right. Then these merchants wanted to take this idea and turn it into a more industrial practice. So towns started building clocks, uh, a single clock tower in the middle of the town so that people could start dividing things up. And then we fast forward further and we get to the Industrial Revolution. This is when we start seeing the individualization of time because pocket watches, small clocks you could bring into your house started becoming mass produced. And this meant that the individual could for the first time really experience their day on an accurate, you know, minute to minute scale. 
And this is coming at the same time that labor itself is being much more exploited in this same sort of mathematical quantified way. So when you could start talking about time in terms of minutes or chunks of an hour, that means you could start dividing it and selling these things in the same way. So, oh, you want to bring me on? I'll work you, you know, 12 hour shift, 16 hour shift. Eventually, after after labor battles were fought hundreds of years later, uh, you know, an eight hour day. Uh, and this conception of free time that we would fight for would also eventually backfire and make it sound like when you aren't on free time, that means it 100% belongs to somebody else, which is why we see so much of this bullshit job stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we also see the emergence of, of talking about time in an entirely new way. Phrases like wasting time, killing time, saving time, losing time, racing against time. These all started popping up in the English language right when we started seeing the mass adoption of clocks and watches. Because we started thinking about time not just as this thing that you experience, but as something that you have, that you can divide and use. And when time became a tool, our perception of it changed. And then you see these problems, like you're talking about, Daniel, where every single one of our days we're doing something we don't want is agony. Uh And time moves so slow. And then when we are doing these enjoyable things, it disappears, just like it would have always before. Right. Well, David, I want to contend a little bit with your contention. Well, specifically, I don't disagree with you uh, in the sense that these things have occurred. I think really the question is what came first, the awareness of time or the tools that we developed to track it and then speed that up. And I think you also have to ask at what, at what levels or, or what caste levels in society did these shifts occur? And I think, you know, like you mentioned Memento Mori, but that originated with merchants. And it's likely that that came about as they were considering time. Their awareness of time had already shifted because that was kind of embedded in their nature of work, of well, tracking shipments and, and all that. Maybe the Memento Mori idea came more from the religious aspect of it. This is something priests were trying to distribute to make sure people were utilizing these things. I, I, I think, actually, it's not from, from the labor that they were doing, but from their efforts to quantify everything. Um, but it also was happening in, in the upper classes that had access to these clocks, first off, um, and then trickled down from there. It's similar to how maps uh, were initially affecting um, map makers and then trickled down to the uh, wealthy who were able to buy them, changed their conceptions, and then eventually people caught up hundreds of years later. So there is, obviously, there's questions of origin and, and historical development here. And Yeah, there's absolutely a push and pull. Well, going back to this particular author, Hartman Rosa, he claims that this trend of acceleration that he says originated more in the 1700s developed not as a response to technology like clocks. Like we didn't accelerate because we invented the train, but kind of the other way around, whether rather new technology emerged in response to our relationship with time and the need to accelerate to drive wealth accumulation faster. To aid economic mm-hmm. growth, you needed faster railways and new forms of communication. Yeah. Well, well I, I agree with him in that context, but I, I think specifically where he mentions in the article, he's referring to transportation technology, how the need to expand the length of your day uh, because everything is moving faster and you, you find that expansion by yourself being able to move faster. And we still talk about this today. Uh, there's a company called Boom that is trying to remake supersonic uh, high-speed air travel for service between places like New York and London. And their pitch, if you go to their website, and the way they're trying to get this venture capitalist funding is that you know there's not enough hours in the day. Sometimes you have to be somewhere in person. And the only way to do that is by traveling faster. And in this spirit is very much still alive and well today, even when we have this instantaneous communication. There's no doubt that trans- like, uh, transportation is like a fundamental uh, need in terms of acceleration, right? We, I mean, in episode 37, Logistics of Slavery, we discussed Deborah Cohen's book, The Deadly Life of Logistics. And she contends that, you know, there's a whole layer of space that's being reorganized globally all around the idea of how do we move a crate of goods from A to B as fast as possible and with as little interruptions as possible. But I think the idea of this acceleration is that it trickles out through all these other things, like even the surveillance that you talked about. Like, yes, maybe we can make the oil men move faster, but we, but there's so many aspects of the economy that we can accelerate to drive that profit forward. Some historians have pointed out that the emergence of the cigarette, for example, was likely given preference over other forms of tobacco smoking because you can do it quicker and that aids productivity. 
And there's a lot of ways that we could talk about how things speed up and, and how this relates to productivity and what came first, clocks or whatever. But I think the important takeaway from this concept is how in the past, speeding things up resulted in very tangible forms of progress, right? We talked about this in our automation episode where the introduction of mechanical automation on farms resulted in very clear economic growth, created new jobs and higher paying jobs and cheap goods that had never existed before. The speeding up in the past opened new possibilities, right? But today we find ourselves in a state of slow collapse, like we talk about every week. And acceleration is no longer a precursor to progress. It is now the requirement to prevent things from declining. It's not that we need to accelerate the economy to unlock some new technology or initiate some great leap forward. We have to accelerate just to keep people employed and barely so. And so we have this uh, uh, effect on a lot of people where as our lives speed up and as we get more stressed and as we have to spend more time being productive and less time enjoying life, we're not getting any material benefit from it. So it feels like we're running in place and we're not really getting anything out of all this added stress. You know, our parents might have had a one-time job that paid them well and set them up and, and gave them a good life, but now we work twice as much for much less return. We're saddled with debt. We have all these problems. In fact, here's a quote uh, from the article. <laughs> I don't know what y'all want from me. <laughs> Daniel, you're like recording a full-on episode. I right thought now. that's what. <laughs> Daniel, can you give us another quote? <laughs> Daniel, uh, you, I, I see what you're saying, but I would love to hear one more quote to wrap up your you. thoughts. Here. <laughs> I know I'm getting, I'm like ready to talk about my articles, and I'm like, oh crap, I'm probably not as prepared as I thought. End quote. End quote. <laughs> Mara, do you feel like you're standing in place uh, with some of? Well, I don't want to ask you about your job because you might not want to talk about that. But David, let me ask you. I mean, you seem pretty busy, right? Like, uh, I know, you know, sometimes we've had to reschedule the podcast. You're like, I'm really stressed with work. I'm busy at the moment. Do you feel like all this extra work you're doing is adding benefit equal to the amount of stress that you're putting into it? Yes. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, no. Well, I mean, I just feel like (laughs) also just with you know, going al- along the lines of time, just all the feeling of always being behind. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, I well, I won't talk about my job as much, but I always feel like I'm not doing enough or I'm not doing enough quickly or uh, I'm behind in my work, which who cares? Like, I, I don't get paid to be thinking about work outside of work. Um, but But just in general in life, like feeling behind, when it's life, how can you be behind in your own life? Yes, that's yeah, really well put. And I think that's what I was trying to convey, but not doing successfully that you just kind of summed up for me. Our current economic system has made us all question our productivity in every moment. And I have felt this. I feel this all the time where I'm not doing something. And in the back of my mind, I'm feeding myself up saying I should be reading. I should be researching. I should be doing something productive. What am I doing with my life? I'm X number of years old. And compared to everyone else, you know, yeah. I have to be at this point in my timeline and, you know, I'm going to be alone when I die, when I'm, you know, because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And where does it come from? Where does all this stress come from? Well, I was just going to say, like, I live in a city where, you know, career development is the thing. And if you're, if you have free time and you're just sitting or watching a movie or something, it means that you don't really care about your career growth you should be volunteering or you should be out networking or you should be mm-hmm. you know trying to develop some more skills like you know outside Non-chuck of work skills Red. making skills <laughs> david did you ever feel this way do you ever feel this way <laughs> we have very different skill development programs i think um i actually feel pretty balanced um not in terms of like uh, the FOMO sort of thing that you're talking about, Daniel, and the like, I'm only this old. What am I doing? Uh, do I have enough time for any of this? I, I feel stressed week to week when I overbook myself. Um, and that typically is my own damn fault. But, uh, but see, that's yeah. But, me, you know, like I was going to say something about you, at least, you know, scheduling that. But like when you work like me, I work a regular 40 hours a week job. 
So I feel stressed just knowing that I'm giving up 40 hours of my time mm-hmm. for, yeah. you know, I probably like if it was 40 hours of my time that I booked that I, you know, OK, I'm stressed, like you said, because I booked it and I probably should cut back. But when it's 40 hours of my time that I'm doing because I have to do 40 hours when realistically I only have just going back to y'all's bullshit yeah. job episode. When I only realistically have like 15 hours worth of work, it's just it really is demoralizing. Preach it. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. So do you think that's why you feel more balanced, David? Because you are more in control of your schedule and your time? It's an artificial sense of control. Absolutely. (laughs) Well, at the same time, I think you have to be balanced with that. this idea about flexible time. and, and, And maybe this is what you were about to get at when you said, I think, the illusion of control, David. And we have to be careful because we live in a gig economy now. And so many people are ostensibly in control of their schedule, right? The Uber driver. But in a way, it's not really control over the time because there's still this uh, necessity to do this work. And uh, this work, a lot of the gig economy work comes from this acceleration, the social acceleration going on to increase the rate at which profits are extracted, right? If those oil rigs need to be uh, drilled faster and the financial markets need to figure it out faster, we have professionals that need to get from A to B faster. So instead of a taxi, let's have 24-7 on-demand Uber service from your smartphone. But who's going to drive those cars? And I think there's a lot of people in this flexible gig economy who do not feel secure at all, who are stressed out of their mind because they're trying to pay bills off of work that's intermittent, that doesn't have any benefits, no insurance, no health care. And in a way, the flexibility hurts them even more because if they miss a day, if they get sick, that comes right out of their income. There's no protection. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of things going on here. You said ostensibly. We're in a thing right now where we both are saying ostensibly. And I think all our listeners should take a shot every time we say ostensibly. Oh, that would have been fun if we would have. But also drink responsibly. Yes, we should. We should do an ashes, ashes, drunk episode. What would the uh, what's the word going to be? Ostensibly. No, we should. Uh, I don't say that every episode. Though. I feel like it had to be something like, "Yeah, that's right, David." No, I was. Yeah, I was actually that talking about lot. like we should get drunk and then record an episode. Oh, we no, we're doing the drinking game. Oh, I like this idea a lot more. Or sure, but first we get drunk, then we do. Oh, the drinking. first we should. Yeah, y'all are gonna be. We could. We we can. Someone definitely has invented oh. that. I hope. Yeah. For the sake of everyone. Yeah, but for the sake of everyone, let's move on to another uh, another article. <laughs> Don't put any of that in there. Okay, so um, the article that I found is by a guy named John Postil at a university in Australia. And in this article, he coins the term um, freedom technologists. Mm. And he refers to them as geeks, hackers, online journalists, tech lawyers, and other social agents who combine technological skills with political acumen to pursue greater internet and democratic freedoms, both globally and domestically. Um, I found it pretty interesting because he basically just talks about different types of protesters um, and how freedom technologists are kind of like those behind the scene social agents that you don't see. So you see the youth, you see the students like protesting in squares and having sit-ins. But these are like protest protesters who work in like online spaces and like hacker like communities um, to push for a change. So I'll give you guys an example. In December 2009, a manifesto in defense of fundamental digital rights was published in opposition to a proposed bill in Spain that was aimed at curtailing Internet piracy. Other protest methods included DDoS attacks, Twitter trending topics, and offline actions. Um, In December 2010, a group of tech lawyers and other freedom technologists launched a successful online mobilization against the bill, Mm -hmm. um, now renamed Lay Biden Sunday in honor of the U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, former U.S. Vice President Joe Biden. This renaming came after WikiLeaks confirmed that the bill was drafted under pressure from the U.S. government. Okay, so fast forward through all that. The point is, um, the mobilization was supported by anonymous hackavistas.net and other hacker formations. There's a hacktivist who's named um, Margarita Padilla, 
And she says the Lucinda struggle brought together networked swarms, such as anonymous and traditional movements, forging monstrous alliances. So anyway, it's basically just talking about how um, what he said, freedom technologists and hacktivists also work behind the scenes and sometimes not behind the scenes to support like um, digital rights, um, to protest. Basically, just people in online communities, um, tech lawyers, hackers um, came together to kind of protest against this. Um, they did some attacks. Um, I don't know what DDoS attacks is, but... Distributed denial of service. Oh. It's basically when you get so many people or computers to like try to visit something that it just like overloads it and shuts it down. Wow. Like if you told everybody all at once to go to ashesashes.org, the servers would, <laughs> would break and... Uh, it would just go away. But we should try it just to be sure. So everybody. If everyone tells two people and you each tell those two people to tell two people, uh, let's see if we can DDoS uh, ashesashes.org. If we're, um, if we're talking about hacktivists, though, I just want to shout out my favorite hacker here. It's uh, somebody who goes by the name Phineas Fisher, whose most notable hack was hacking a company called The Hacking Team. Which, as we've talked about before on this show, Daniel, is one of these evil companies that makes spyware and then sells it to oppressive governments around the world so that they can spy on and uh, oppress, torture, and ultimately murder their citizens. So uh, Phineas Fisher got it in their head that said, hey, this is an evil, fucked up thing to do, and I'm going to do something about it. And so they hacked it, released all their tools, uh, released all their database, the information of who they had been hacking uh, which customers they had and uh, basically destroyed the company though they did come back um, and they are still around and doing the same exact thing unfortunately. Uh, Phineas Fisher went on to uh, write some tutorials to help other people hack they wrote a uh, piece that explained how to skim credit cards in a way that you wouldn't damage the people who uh, ultimately have the credit card but then you could use that uh, money to send it to the Kurds that's what they were doing. They were converting this money that they stole to Bitcoins and making sure that they were only taking the money in ways that people would be refunded for. So basically robbing from the banks, changing it to Bitcoin, and then donating it to the Kurds and their efforts uh, out in Rojava and stuff. So a uh, pretty cool person. Uh, the police thought they arrested them a couple times, specifically the Spanish police. Um, but as far as I know, they have not been able to catch them and they're still out there, hopefully doing good. Hopefully. But uh, you talked a lot about hackers here, uh, Mariah, but there are a lot of people who are doing this digital behind the scenes work in so much of the protest and resistance movements around the world. So if you remember back in Standing Rock, there were a number of hackers uh, and uh, IT people out there who were able to establish long range internet links uh, to make sure that the camp could stay online and keep data uh, live and get news information out of the camp to the rest of the world. Uh, that's something they just took upon themselves to do. It happened in the background. You never heard about it, but it made so much of the press going on visible. Right. Uh, there's lots of organizations doing work all around the country. Here in New York, we have a group called NYC Mesh, which is trying to set up a second internet basically across New York to offer free or low cost internet specifically to residents who cannot access it because they can't afford it. So lots of government run housing. We have a, a the the city housing agency is called NYCHA, so they've been setting up free Wi-Fi for some of these NYCHA housings. And it's just a concerned group of nerds, basically, who said, hey, you know, we can do this thing right now. We're not in the streets. We're not visible. The only thing you'll see is maybe a satellite dish that went up on top of a building. But we are actively making people's lives easier. And, and in all the organizations that I'm part of that are politically involved, that are politically active, uh, I end up doing a lot of the IT work for them as well. Uh, and uh, there is so much stuff that happens in the back end to make all the stuff that you see on the streets possible and to make sure everybody is safe and uh, the organizing happens in a secure way. And uh, if you are somebody who doesn't want to get into the streets, who doesn't think you can get involved, uh, there are so many ways that you can do these things behind the scenes, not just technologically, but in many ways. Yeah, and that was kind of the that was kind of the point of the article was just to talk about how what he calls freedom technologists um, contributes to like the convergence of internet freedom activism and just broader struggles over social justice and things like that. I thought I found it really interesting. Um, 
I actually never really thought about other types of or different kinds of protesting or protesters in non like physical spaces and like digital spaces. So I, I thought it was really interesting. And I like what you what you said about, you know, not being discouraged and about thinking about other ways to get involved in. Well, yeah, I mean, protesting is is the very visible and, and obvious way that, that we see these types of events happening. But the most important and the most necessary organizing that occurs is usually invisible. It's somebody meeting uh, a neighborhood association. It's a city council meeting. It's people, organizers who are actually mm-hmm. out in the field organizing that allow everything else to happen. And you never see these people because they're so busy working their asses off to make everything that you do see possible. And again, so you don't have to have IT skills to do this if you can talk to somebody and you don't even have to talk to them well. But if you have enough uh, willpower and are brave enough to go and just talk to somebody you don't know, then you can be somebody who is working behind the scenes to make all this stuff possible, to spread all these ideas, to connect people where they need to be connected and to let everybody know, you know, you're not out there alone. Yeah, I think that's a really great point that the protesters in the streets are what is so visible. and. I liked how he categorized online journalists as part of this uh, freedom technologist uh, category because when these protest movements go on, the very broad and large news cycles um, are very quick to frame these things in terms that you know is not too provocative, not too challenging to current power structures. And so just being there on the ground and sharing what's actually going on in a, in, in a way that other people can access, I feel like, wow, that's also a supporting role. And just like you said, organizing david and and actually on the point of organizing we have a listener who is uh, developing an app right now you can find a link to it if you go to our website hit the community tab and it's the page what are we doing uh his app is called earthrise it's still in development you can reach out to him if you want to help with that but the idea is to make it easier for people to post organizing events specifically around climate change activism but in a way that kind of uh puts it all together in one place so that it's easy to figure out what's going on in your area or it's help get the word out. So definitely check that out if you can. And uh, the word freedom technologist kind of reminds me too of that uh, Four Vinegar Thieves Collective, David, that we talked about in episode 46, mm. mm-hmm. Pill of Sale, uh, Michael Lawfer, and how they're developing do-it-yourself life-saving drugs. And then, you know, how could a freedom technologist play a role in that if you're not, uh, you know, a PhD in biochemical stuff? Maybe you could help organize around getting access to those do-it-yourself drugs or something like that. Anyway, you want to organize us around another article, David? Our last and final one? (laughs) So I guess that takes us towards the tail end of this episode. The final thing we're going to be discussing today, uh, it's a little bit contentious and I really want to just pare down a small part of it. Uh, But as mentioned in the beginning of this episode, uh, we have the New Zealand Shooters Manifesto here. You can read it on your website if it's not banned in your country. And if it is banned in your country, you should read it anyway, because there's no reason not to. Uh, There's nothing (laughs) that that is in it that will like instantly make you a shooter. Uh, And I think the banning of it is problematic and we'll maybe discuss that in a moment. But Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's important because it raises a lot of issues that we've discussed uh, on this show, and it sort of touches on a lot of them, surprisingly, but it pulls a lot of different conclusions and it misses, I think, a lot of important things. And we're not going to get into any great depth of it. But what I really wanted to focus on uh, was this rise of eco-fascism that it specifically calls out. And the shooter themselves refers to themselves repeatedly as an eco-fascist. And this is something I think we're going to see, unfortunately, increasingly as time goes on and the situation becomes more dire and people turn to whatever extremes they can find for some sort of solution. And uh, there's the full manifesto, like I said, is on the site. It's 87 pages. It reads quickly. You can skim it. Uh, And I just want to quickly bring up a couple of things that they mentioned. And we on this show have done a lot of conversations around overpopulation and overconsumption. And this is a very common theme that you'll see in the collapse community. People saying, well, you know, the reason the world is so fucked is because there's too many people. And we tried to point out in that episode that we did, episode 39, Impacts of Growth, that talking only about population is just half the equation. And what really is the issue 
is consumption. Yeah, if that. And only because population is a component of total consumption. And if anything, very small amounts of the population are responsible for huge amounts of the consumption, causing the vast majority of the climate catastrophes that we see. And uh, and we'll elaborate on that point uh, if you want to have more thoughts on that, as well as the full history of some of the horrible genocides, uh, sterilizations, and other things this type of thinking has enabled. That episode is a good jumping point for that. But uh, throughout this manifesto, throughout this text, the author writes about uh, concerns that people are breeding too quickly. And again, this is something that you see all the time in collapsed conversations. And I think it's a really slippery slope argument because when you have somebody say, well, there's too many people and people are breeding too quickly, that immediately leads you to solutions. And of course, the final solution here, which is we need to kill a bunch of these people or we need to sterilize these people so they can no longer breed. And that inevitably leads you to situations like we just saw uh, in New Zealand. His motivation for a lot of this was in part because he felt they were being invaded by foreigners who had much higher birth rates than the white population. And, and his particular strand of ecofascism is, is, is very specific. It, uh, it, it ties in a lot with ethno-nationalism, which is an w- interesting type of racism where you, you say, you know, it, it's not that I'm racist against you know, black people, or in fact, they wouldn't even say that. They would say, you know, Mexicans or, or Nigerians or whatever. Uh, and oftentimes it gets very specific like that. Uh, it's just that I don't think they should be in my country. I think they should stay in their country. So a country for all the white people, right. a country for all the brown people, a country for all the Muslims, a country for all the Jews. And they say that in this writing. They say, oh, I love foreigners. I love... I love people of different cultures. I used to travel and they treated me as friends. Mm-hmm. But it's just when they're in my country that we need to get rid of them. Yeah, and it's, it's very much a stretch of trying to apply uh, this sort of arbitrary rule set to justify these murders they commit. Because they also talk about this as an issue of, well, certain races breed much more than the white race. And their big fear is that white people, whatever the fuck white people means, and that's a definition that's always changing, and it has meant hundreds of different things over the past hundred years, uh, not to get too deep into that, but whatever white people means to this author, they aren't breeding, and it feels so gross to use this language, but they, they aren't breeding fast enough compared to non-white people who are breeding faster and eventually will replace white people who will become the minority. And uh, then th- as they write, they say, you, and you never want to be a minority in a country. And I guess you never want to be a minority because of people like this person who <laughs> right. is happy to use power over you. Maybe that's where the fear comes from. It's like, wow, if, you know, if, if my type of people can be so terrible to these minorities, well, imagine if, yeah, imagine if the tables were turned. Exactly. Well, this is one of the points I really want to get to is, is that this person, like they identified this tragic symptom, which is that the people in power use that power over those who have less power than minorities in this case. But instead of saying, you know, asking why that's the case or maybe we should do something about it, it says, so we should make sure we never become minorities and just accept this as like a way of of things, of of the way things should be. Um, But uh, he couches all this this race birth rate justification in the idea that, oh, it's not because I'm racist, but it's about I looking out for the world Oh my God. because there's too many people consuming too much stuff. So what I'm actually doing isn't about racism, though they say that they are they both say that they are racist and they aren't there's a lot of contradictions <laughs> yeah it's so fucked up yeah i was gonna say it's like so fucked up where do you go? yeah but specifically that oh we we can't let them breed because they're destroying the world because we can't have 10 billion people or 50 billion or 100 people on earth eventually we have to go down we need a smaller population so so their solution isn't even that white people should have more children their solution is that Everybody else should have less, but that's not fast enough, so we should do something about it, like they, they tried to do. And, and, Jeez, and man. this is so important right now because I see this overpopulation argument all the time. And in fact, it's not even from fringe groups. Bill Gates was recently, very recently, in the news talking about how birth rates, particularly in places like Africa, are too damn high. And that they are causing problems for themselves because of this. And this is the exact same language the shooter's using in their manifesto to justify their murders. The fact that it's being parroted by these, these very successful philanthropists or whatever, uh, people like Bill Gates, people like Steven Pinker, saying, you know, this is a problem. We need to do something about it. But then they just like leave that second part open and there's like, oh yeah, we'll give out condoms or something, which is, you know, it's not a bad program. But it justifies these ideas in the first place when, again, Bill Gates by himself is 
consuming far more resources, damaging far more of the world's environment than hundreds, thousands of people in Africa. But he's never the problem, it's somebody else. And the shifting of the blame is the same exact thing the shooter's doing, but in this very neoliberal philanthropic language instead, and that somehow makes it okay, and it becomes a PR piece uh, that people celebrate and discuss talking about his malaria efforts or something. And so it's, it's, it's just really important, and the, the only reason really that I'm bringing it up on this show, um, and, and we really should spend more time on this, uh, I could do a whole show on it, but there's, there's so much depth and, and angles, um, but this concept was so important to me, I just really wanted to discuss it. Yeah, I think it's an interesting connection you made between the language from Bill Gates and the language that was used in the manifesto. Yeah, and, and I took some, I read the manifesto and I took some notes on, on just how many contradictions there were. And I kind of wanted to discuss that just because it's, uh, I don't know, just, just to have this intellectual discussion about these contradictions in his, his thinking. But then I realized you can't really argue these types of ideologies on their own terms because anytime someone wants to do something terrible, they're going to justify it. We are a rational species. It's what we do. And you know, no one wants to think that they're the bad person. Mm-hmm. No one wants to think they're evil. This person believes that what they're doing is helping the world, like you said. So they're going to justify it. And with something so horrible as this, of course, the justification you know, has contradictions, is a paradox in itself, because what it fundamentally comes down to is just racism, right? A fear of the other and the fear of you know, this oppression that exists in the world. Well, and the knowledge of it and the fear that at one point you might become the other. Right. And so I don't think it makes sense to like uh, to argue against what this person is saying in terms of like the intellectual or logical component of this, because you're not going to defeat it that way. The, the language will just shift. If you can point out some logical fallacy with the thinking of why we need to, you know, murder a minority, you know, someone else will just come along with a, a more airtight, logical reasoning for it, because that's not really the point. And so I guess, you know, what is the point of bringing up this manifesto, David? Maybe it's because it does conjure some of the symptoms of a broken system that we talk about on this show. Things like, you know, I will bring up that he does mention that we have a problem with capitalism and the pursuit of profit in our economic system, which ultimately destroys the environment. But their problem with that is that it, it's void of some national ideology, right? And so I think it's important to talk about this in the sense that the topics that we discuss and awareness of a broken world can open the door for some people to point fingers at the wrong places. And I think that's something we have to be aware of because someone might come with the language that we're now familiar with of being anti-exploitation, of wanting to protect the environment. But embedded in that could be these really uh, uh, twisted ideas of social relationship that we shouldn't accept. If we know that's a possibility, we can refine our language so that when we talk about these issues, we can prepare our refutation. Well, in so much as we can, I guess, Daniel, because I think, as you mentioned, a lot of this is not necessarily a logical argument, but an emotional argument post-justified with whatever reasoning they can figure out. But, uh, and, and again, I really want to emphasize the environmental nature of this attack and of this line of thinking that they've tried to do, taking this traditional idea of genocide and coupling it with this overpopulation, we have to do something or else the world is destroyed thoughts. And, but this is not the first time this has happened. And, and I just want to read uh, one or two things real quick, not from the manifesto, but from something else uh, that shows that fascism and environmentalism actually have been uh, very close bedfellows before. So bear with me just for one second. We recognize that separating humanity from nature, from the whole of life, leads to humankind's own destruction and to the death of nations. Sounds pretty good, right? I'm down. Only through a reintegration of humanity into the whole of nature can our people be made stronger. That is the fundamental point of the biological tasks of our age. Humankind alone is no longer the focus of thought, but rather life as a whole. This striving towards connectedness with the totality of life, with nature itself, a nature into which we are born, pretty, pretty good so far, right? Mm-hmm. This is the deepest meaning and the true essence of national socialist thought. So there's the end. Uh, They said that what actually being a Nazi is, this was written in 1934 by Ernst Lehmann, is being an environmentalist. And at the time, uh, people who joined the Nazi party 
environmentalists joined at a rate six times higher than regular people because these ideas were used to push people towards fascism. The idea that we, as a people, are united. Also, we are united with the earth. Um, And we can have all that thought. We can have that unity and we can have that environmental responsibility without the purging and genocide that happens. Uh, But it is so often used to justify these actions, especially when you add the aesthetics and the ideas of fascism with it. This has happened before, exactly like this. And so that's why I really want to take a moment, and I'm, I'm not somebody who yells fascism at every single thing I see, but when someone explicitly says, I am an eco-fascist, and, and, and he writes in this manifesto, for the, maybe the first time when the media calls somebody a fascist, they will actually be a fascist because that is what I am. We need to stop and listen. We need to read this and realize that we're going to see this increasingly as the disasters get bigger. As the refugees become more numerous, what was that number, Daniel? By, by 2060, the UN estimates between a billion and a billion and a half refugees. That's 40 years from now. With a B, yeah. A billion. And your political systems, as they exist now, will not survive this. They will be thrown to some sort of extreme. And extremism by itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes extreme situations like these refugees require extreme solutions, but extreme oftentimes, unfortunately, means deadly solutions. And if we don't push back against these ideas now by talking about them, by admitting that, that we are pushing them in the media at the moment with people like Bill Gates, priming people to find these lines of thinking, then we're going to have a very serious problem a few decades from now. And, and the fact that countries like New Zealand are banning people from reading this document, from discovering this on their own, I think is just going to make it worse. We can't stick our head into the sand. I know that's the, the standard answer that every state is trying to do with every bad thing that's happening right now. But this is something that needs to be brought out and discussed and torn apart and all those holes that are in it pointed and poked and pulled apart and revealed for the fragile post-justification of an action that it is. The flim sheet of environmentalism covering this disgusting background of racism that motivated these attacks. They need to be revealed for what they are. Because if we just let them sit there as this edgy, sexy, banned thing, then it's going to push people who are already primed to these ideas because of the way the media discusses them, because of people like Bill Gates, because of people like Steven Pinker, who are paving the road to fascism for young and impressionable minds, then this is going to happen again and again. And so it's our duty to have this conversation. As we discussed so often on this show, David, the, the systems breaking our world apart seek to break us apart, to break our relationships apart, to better uh, isolate us for various reasons. And the more we can be aware of that, maybe the more we can push back against it and realize that that's not going to be the solution, that that is the cause of so many of our problems. And that if we truly want a better world, we have to come together in open arms love and acceptance and have a few conversations along the way. Is there anything we want to discuss about what can we do? I mean, we kind of covered a a hodgepodge of different things, a diversity of topics. This was kind of like a show and tell episode. You know, I brought my articles, y'all brought your articles. (laughs) In case we didn't know what show and tell. Yeah. (laughs) Are there any common themes y'all think we need to hit on in terms of how to go forward? Or is this just a lot to think about? You really set me up for failure, Daniel. How do we how do we tie together a show that started with dolphins <laughs> and ended with mass murder? You see, I had the easy articles. Other than the the single unifying theme, even in Mariah's is the, is trying to overcome these destructive tendencies that we find is the the thread of our lives right now. Here's an idea: if and you, pushing back against them where we can, if you drive. That's, I think that's a good point, pushing back against them where we can, how we can, right. we can. For instance, if you pilot a shipping vessel in the North Atlantic, uh, maybe consider the dolphins. Or maybe we can take a page out of episode 54, Golden Age, and hoist our sails and hit the seas. Or we could be like um, the freedom technologists, geeks and hackers, online journalists, other... As David mentioned, um, behind the scenes, community organizers who are really pushing for Internet freedom and so forth. Yeah, no doubt. Check out that app. And use it as an excuse to get involved. There's so many people out there doing so much good work. I know we talk about so many bad things on this episode. 
But it's not hard for you to find a little bit of good out there and to do some good yourself. You can find more information about all these articles, the articles themselves, some ancillary information, and a full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible. We will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, or supporting us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast. You can find stickers there and we appreciate your support. We are also on all your favorite social media networks at ashes ashes cast. So check us out on Instagram or come to our subreddit. We've also got a great Discord community, which you can find a link for on our website. If you go to the top, click community, you'll find an invitation link there. Until next week, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Well, that was a that was an episode. <laughs> OMG, I cannot. I, I just can't.